Good evening. Spooky Halloween, everybody. Welcome to VAMP. I'm Ivor Mecton, as you can see. Thank you. Thank you. And if you're wondering, man, what is a veterinary, veterinary medication for roundworm parasites doing here? All I can say is, girl, <laughs> welcome to my 2021. But to answer your question, my agent called and said, do you want to host a storytelling show? And I said, sure, why not? Beats the heck out of sitting around on eBay being fought over by some angry conspiracy people. The show tonight, as most of you probably know, is brought to you by So Say We All, a local literary and storytelling nonprofit based here in San Diego. Who's, yes, give it up for San Diego. <laughs> and So Say We All. So Say We All's mission is to create opportunities for people to tell their stories and to tell them better. So Say We All does this in three main ways, education, publishing, and performance. In education, So Say We All offers outreach programs for communities who have been talked about more than heard from, and that includes veterans, military veterans, and LGBTQ plus people. For publishing, I hope you've all seen the merch table back in the back. There are, there's a brand new anthology from our queer writer, writer series called The Whole Alphabet. There are multiple publications, thank you, thank you for the queers. Um, <laughs> hey. Um, there are good, really several compilations from our Veterans Writers Program and podcast called Incoming. And for spooky Halloween, there are several horror anthologies. All the books are beautifully produced. They look amazing. I've got a complete set. Get yours. And then the third thing, education, publishing, performance, that's what you're here for tonight, right? Here to, hear, here to, here to see a show. We have seven amazing storytellers for you here tonight. Our theme is Night Shift. Two important notes about our show here and being here with us at the Whistle Stop before we start. One is everyone's here to hear, everyone is here to hear the stories. It is also a very crowded bar. Most of you are here with friends or you're making new friends, hopefully. So what that means is while the stories are going on, some of you will have the, be inspired to cosplay one of the most important people in your human society, librarians, and shush the people around you. Please do this. Be the librarian. Be the librarian, shush people. If you don't want to spray saliva, because even though the pandemic, pandorama, pan whatever is still going on, it, it's a lot better, it's still going on. So if you don't want to spread your saliva, you can just give them that gorgeous, sexy librarian evil eye that we all know, um, and they'll know what you mean and they'll quiet down because the horse medication told you to do that. Another sexy, exalted creature in your human society is the bartender, I hear. Can we hear it for our bartenders? Yeah. So what happens when we're here and we're busy and we're crowded and we're having a good time and we're drinking is that the bar can run out of glasses. No glasses, no drinks. So what we do here, part of our community, part of our getting along and loving everybody, is we pass empty glasses back. So if you are between me and the bar, which all of you are, and somebody hands you an, here we go, look, look, people modeling the correct behavior, I love it, I love it, thank you. So this is, this is part, of the, part of the show, is passing back the empty glasses so that we can all get our next drink. All right. Final note before we finally get to the damn stories that you're here for, So Say We All runs on volunteers, who I will, int who I will introduce later, who helped produce the show tonight, put it together. So Say We All also runs on your donations. So thank you to all of you who put your $5 in the pot or more perhaps on the way in. If you're inspired, you can drop more in the bucket. You can become a member on our website. Um, but please, please uh, keep up with us and contribute in any way that you can. And now, thanks be to the gay Jesus, it is time for stories. So I should say thanks to Elvira. It's Halloween. Thanks to Elvira, the goddess. Yeah. Time for the stories. The seven stories tonight are from the exciting lives and creative minds of Christy Nail. Yes, yes. Peter Serino. Jake Peterson. 
Adam Greenfield, Jay Carroll, and Dallas McLaughlin, and our first performer and first time, first her first time at VAMP. Please give it up for Yvette Valadez. Hi. <laughs> So the year after I graduated high school was the most distinctive and dark period of my entire life. I didn't know who I was or what my purpose in life was. I was living with my then boyfriend and struggling to maintain a crumbling relationship with my mother. To distract myself from my reality and to avoid all contact with those around me, I took a part-time job at a fast food restaurant a few blocks away from the college I was attending. Ironically, the restaurant opened its doors to students, but gave them the worst work hours. <laughs> That's how I ended up working the night shift. I couldn't complain. The job was easy. It engaged me in a loop of false kindness and forced smiles like being an actor. And it kept me away from home. Three people worked during the night shift. A manager, a cook, and I, the cashier. Nights were usually quiet. Except for weekends, of course, as these were the nights when drunk college will stop by and order a hundred nuggets. <laughs> but this particular night was more silent. It was a Tuesday night, and the manager did paperwork in the office while the cook washed dishes in the back of the kitchen. I was stuck in cups and ketchup while waiting for, the, for a customer to stop by the drive-thru. So far that night, we only had two, and that made the shift feel longer. I was starting to get sleepy and my feet ached from standing too long. My lunch break, which was at three in the morning, was still an hour away. It felt like an eternity. I was never the type of person to break the rules and slack off in plain sight because it will make Mr. McDon Mr. McDonald's and his casual look, look bad. So I asked the cook to cover me while I went to the bathroom. I crossed the empty lobby and went into the bathroom. Then I went into one of those empty stalls, lowered the toilet lid, and sat down. I happily excelled when I felt my back crack and muscles relax. <laughs> I wasn't planning to sit there for too long, just enough to rest from that torturous slow night. I took out my cell phone and checked it for a couple of minutes, scrolling through my social media to distract myself because none of my friends could be awake to chat at two in the morning. Suddenly, I heard a slam. I jumped, startled when someone locked herself in the stall next to me. I hadn't heard the bathroom door open in the first place, which was why it took me by surprise. I ignored the situation and returned to my phone, knowing I had to get back to work soon, taking one last look at some photos. Hello, Yvette. I froze. A female voice was calling me from, calling me from the cubicle next to me. I didn't recognize the person, but her voice sounded like a teenage girl. Hello? I lowered my head to look through the space under the stall at the feet of the person speaking to me, trying to recognize them. She was wearing black sweatpants and tennis shoes. She couldn't be a coworker because even off the clock, we always wore these hideous slip resistant shoes. The staff room was across the kitchen and the floor was really greasy. Are you okay? The girl asked. Yeah, I replied. I didn't know who she was, but for some reason, I felt compelled to respond and keep the conversation going. Are you sure? Yeah. There was a pause and she went, in which she no longer said anything, and I began to wonder why she was concerned about my well-being. I'm a pretty shy person, so it didn't occur to me to ask her for her name. How's your mom? She asked. <laughs> Is she still sick? My blood, my blood ran cold in my veins. How did she know that my mother was sick? I never shared my private life with anyone. People knew nothing about me, apart from what they saw on social media, of course. And as far as I could remember, they could only see that I had a boyfriend and a cat. There was no way she knew about my mother's state of health or existence. I lowered my head again, trying my best to recognize the person who knew such a personal piece of information. She was still sitting there, still as a statue, probably waiting for my response. But I didn't want to talk anymore. Fear was taking hold of me, and I felt nauseous. She's fine, I responded quickly and flushed the toilet, pretending that I had finished relieving myself. 
Then I hurried out of the stall to wash my hands. I wasn't planning on leaving yet. I had to see the person I had been talking to for the past five minutes. How did she know my name? How did she know that I was the one in the stall next to her? How did she, how did she know about my mother and her illness? I washed my hands slowly, waiting for the girl to flush the toilet, step, step out of the stall, and face me. But she never came out. I washed my hands, combed my hair, and rewashed them for several minutes. And the girl never came out. When I lost my patience, I walked over to the bathroom stall and knocked on the door. And when the slight force pushed it open, I gasped at the emptiness. My heart began racing against my chest in utter terror. When did she leave? I hadn't heard her enter or leave the bathroom, which could be understandable, but I never saw her leave the bathroom stall. The toilet was clean, and there was no trace of it being used by anyone, anyone since the janitor cleaned it before he left. I stormed out of the bathroom and ran to the kitchen. I went straight to the cook and asked him what the customer who came out of the bathroom looked like. He gave me a strange look and said we hadn't had any customers since I went to the bathroom. I asked him to cover me again and made my way to the office where the manager was doing paperwork. Maybe the cook hadn't seen anyone come out of the bathroom because he was in the kitchen and perhaps the girl had only used the bathroom without making a purchase. However, no one could hide from the security cameras. I explained to the manager what had happened in the bathroom, not in detail, but the necessary parts. He laughed and said that lack, the lack of sleep was getting me, but he reviewed the footage upon my request. There was nothing. One of the lobby cameras pointed directly at the bathroom doors, but no one had been in or out in the past hour, hour other, other than me. I was sure what, what had happened. I had a short conversation with someone who knew very personal details about me and had also seen her feet through the space below the bathroom stall. She was a real person. The manager didn't believe me. He joked that I might have seen a ghost. Afterward, he told me to take my lunch break and even gave me a free meal to calm me down. <laughs> After that night, I asked to be transferred to a different shift. I worked, that, I worked the afternoon shift for a while and went home at 10 o'clock. But every time, every time I saw the night shift cashier come in to replace me, I remembered that bizarre encounter. I thought a lot about the conversation I had with that un unknown girl. Am I okay? I answered yes out of habit, but the truth was that I wasn't. Was my mother okay? No, she was sick, and I wasn't aware of what was happening in her daily life. So one day, I stopped avoiding her, and we began to go out to get together more. She had depression, and so did I. She needed me as much as I needed her. Slowly, the cloud that darkened my days dissipated, and I could see a brand new day. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened if I hadn't met the girl in the bathroom that night. I like to think that it was a signal from the universe to wake up, get out of the monotony, and fix all the things that haunted me instead of just putting up with them. And one of those things was working the night shift. I vote never to work the night shift again. <laughs> Yvette Valadez, first time vampire, everybody. My stomach was in knots, reeling with anxiety as my friend and I rode our motorcycles into Mexico to do the scariest thing I have ever done. The stakes were high with my life on the line, and if what we were going there to do didn't work, I would be out 10 grand and worse than that, swallowed by the opiate addiction I'd suffered through my entire adult life. If you haven't figured it out yet, I'm not like you regular people. I mean, I'm sure you're all addicted to something, but I doubt many... <laughs> I doubt many of you have spent years smoking fentanyl or heroin in a drug den in TJ. So for my unique problem, I had a unique solution. And of course, I do everything in the most unconventional, extreme, confusing, back-ass, scary, risky, fucked up way possible. So for me, when it came to drug treatment, instead of 12 grueling steps or 30 lame inpatient days, or talking about my feelings, yuck, I took a shortcut and did what I've always done. I took a drug to solve my problem.
For almost a year before that ride to Mexico, I'd been hiding my relapse and fentanyl use from everyone I know. The isolation of living in a prison cell surrounded by walls I had built was getting to be too much to bear, so I came clean to a, cl a few close friends. The first person I told was Andrea. She's the least judgmental person I know, reacted with kindness, and wasn't surprised. She told me about psychedelic therapies, and more specifically, one called Ibogaine. It's derived from a tree bark in Africa and is used to treat opiate addiction because of the repair work it does on the brain, essentially resetting the receptors to the state they were in before one ever took an opiate. Oh, and to get those effects, you have to trip out on a psychedelic in Mexico because it isn't legal in the US. <laughs> she told me about this insane ibogaine thing and at the time I thought, what a fucking hippie nut job. There's zero chance I'm going to Mexico to take a hardcore drug to get off drugs. It made no sense. My fear of going to Mexico to take some freaky African tree bark drug was enough to make me get sober, and I've been clean ever since. I'm joking. <laughs> the very thought of my addiction being so bad that I had someone I love and trust suggest such an extreme intervention sent me straight to TJ to get high to deal with the emotions it evoked. I wanted to get clean on my own so badly, but each time I failed, I sunk lower into isolation and misery. Ibogaine started to look more enticing, so I asked Andrea if, she'd be, if she would go with me to check out the clinic that performs these ceremonies in Mexico. The adventure of finding this place is a tale for another day, but when we eventually found it, I was impressed. It's a beautiful house overlooking the ocean. The head nurse explained the entire process. First off, it's not safe to mix ibogaine with fentanyl, so if I didn't want to detox at the clinic, I needed to show up clean. Upon arrival, they would test my vitals, drug screen, and do lab work to ensure I was healthy enough to take ibogaine. The trip would last anywhere from 12 to 72 hours, and I would have relived memories and a spiritual experience that would potentially would help cure me of my addiction. They only do the ceremonies overnight because the doctors have day jobs, and on ibogaine, you become extremely sensitive to light, so being in the dark is best. There's a full medical staff and a psychologist, but I would need to be alone during my trip for the biggest impact. They would have a camera on me so they'd see if I decided to take a nosedive out of bed, and would also, there would also be a button next to me I could push to call for help if needed. I'd be hooked up to an EKG machine to monitor my heart, since ibogaine has been known to rarely cause heart failure. It, se <laughs> it seemed thorough, but this still scared the shit out of me. He told me I could bring a loved one, and my first thought was, who the fuck would be willing to do this with me? <laughs> my anxiety was through the roof as I sunk deeper into my own fear, but then somewhere far off, I heard Andrea volunteer to escort me to Mexican hardcore psychedelic rehab. I couldn't believe it. Did I imagine that? I have never had a person offer me so much of themselves, and after some back and forth, I gratefully accepted. That was that, we scheduled it, and Christy, the professional drug addict nail who had avoided help for two decades, was finally going to rehab. <laughs> I joke that this type of treatment was a shortcut, but the truth is, at the time, it didn't feel like one to me. The days leading up to my stay at the clinic were the scariest and most emotional of my life. I had lived with my addiction for almost 20 years, never getting any help. And here I was, paying all that money, taking this massive risk on this totally unconventional treatment. I was suffocating under the weight of the desire for it to work. I was so fucking afraid I would go through all this and come back the same old me and just get high again. I was scared for my life taking this drug I'd never heard of anyone doing before. I was scared I would fail myself and Andrea and the staff. If this didn't work, I was gonna come back home and pick up right where I left off and continue to spend thousands on dope and risk my life constantly with the threat of overdosing. But in addition to all the fear and anxiety, I also felt a sense of pride for finally admitting to myself that I needed a serious intervention and for going through with it. Emotionally, I was all over the place. I rarely cry, but I shed a lot of tears leading up to my stay at the clinic. The day came, and upon arrival, I expected my drug test to be clean because at the clinic, I was told it takes five days for fentanyl to get out of your system. 
So I did the math. Five days is 120 hours. That's 7,200 minutes. So that's the amount of time I stayed clean. What a shock. My drug test popped positive for fentanyl. I was devastated. I put my head down on the table, intensely disappointed in myself. I didn't want to waste everybody's time sitting around detoxing. I had planned on doing the ibogaine the night I arrived, recovering for two or three days and getting the hell out of there. But when they showed me I tested positive for fentanyl, saying I needed to be hooked up to an IV for the next four days detoxing, I was a wreck. I couldn't believe I had to have that needle in my hand chained to that damn IV 24-7 now. A few hours after they hooked me up to the IV, the withdrawals began. Withdrawing off fentanyl is torture, physically and mentally. Your body is coming apart at the seams, and for 12 to 24 hours, you wish you were fucking dead. Thankfully, they were humane and gave me morphine so that I didn't have to be sick cold turkey. Having avoided the withdrawals with medication, all there was left to do was not rip that needle out of my hand and sit around waiting for four days. But let me tell you something about junkies. We need constant stimulation. And here I was being told, you can't consume any drugs or alcohol, go anywhere outside the clinic grounds, and you literally have to just chill for four days. Now I get it, for some of you mentally stable people, this is your wet dream. <laughs> but for me, it was a death sentence. In Mexican rehab, when your only job is to not get high or rip that needle out of your hand, you really only have five things to do. Netflix in bed, a walk around the grounds, read books, talk with other patients and staff, or try to play piano, even though your musical ability is limited to stumbling through the one song you know, heart and soul. Once again, Andrea was my rock, as she amuses the shit out of me and was the reason I kept sane and made it through those four days and surprisingly enjoyed myself. In hindsight, showing up dirty for fentanyl was the best possible scenario. Those four days gave me a chance to get to know the staff and learn how compassionate and professional they were. The calming effect of being forced to slow down and relax was the perfect reset to mentally prepare myself for ibogaine. I don't believe in God, but shit, it really does feel like things happen for a reason sometimes. I tested clean on the fourth day, so that night I was finally able to do ibogaine. Thanks to my detox days, getting to know the swing of things, my nerves had, had subsided and I had fallen into a quiet readiness in a peaceful place. At the last minute, they added a potassium IV drip since my lab showed my levels were a bit low. I appreciated how thorough they were, but if you've ever done a psychedelic, can you even imagine what it's like to trip balls hooked up to an EKG and a damn IV? and there's a camera on you with people watching from another room? <laughs> Talk about trippy. <laughs> but it didn't bother me the way you'd think. It was actually comforting knowing there were medical professionals monitoring everything. Andrea was allowed to stay with me until I started tripping, but after that, I was on my own. It's near impossible for me to put what happened during my ibogaine trip into words, and part of me just wants to keep it for myself anywhere. anyway. I will share one thing about it though. One of my relived memories was a sexual experience I had and all that blood rushed to you know where and it fucking hurt. <laughs> I glanced over at the camera staring at me and I was so glad I'm not a man because my arousal would have been lifting the sheet up. <laughs> I couldn't handle things on my own with the staff watching so I forced myself to redirect my trip to something other than hot lesbian sex. The rest of my trip is mine to keep, but you're welcome for that tidbit. <laughs> I tripped all night for a total of about 12 hours. I just laid on my bed, hooked up to machines, closed my eyes, and let the drug take me on my journey. Ibogaine renders your body practically useless, and the IV made me have to pee a lot, so bathroom trips were quite the field trip. I would push the call button for the nurse, eagerly await for the bedroom door to open. In would come Sammy. My face would light up. Hi, I'd say with childlike glee to see him again. He lifted me up and helped me walk to the bathroom. I say walk, but really I was stumbling and giggling like a drunk. He got me to the toilet and left me to my business in the most respectful way. It's an intense thing to be that dependent on someone for basic needs like walking or peeing, and it bonded me to him in a very special way. 
Usually the day after doing a drug, you feel like shit, but not Ibogaine. The day after my trip was one of the most enjoyable of my life. In my mind was silent, white peace. I felt euphoric, giggly, and for lack of a better term, drunk yet clear-headed. The staff couldn't believe how quickly I was recovering. <laughs> The staff <laughs> couldn't believe how quickly I was recovering because most people are bedridden the entire next day. But yet again, I'm not regular people, so I had a blast walking around the clinic even though my legs felt like rubber. I had no balance and zero reaction time. I would start to fall, try to move my leg to catch myself, but nothing would happen. I'd just begin to tip over. But of course, Andrea was right there to catch me, and even though she's half my size, she never did let me fall. <laughs> We stayed two more days for my body to fully recover, and on my last morning after some emotional goodbyes, we took off on our motorcycles, giving me time to reflect on the days leading up to treatment. I wished that I had known then what I know now. Ibogaine clinics, when done correctly, might be unconventional in America, but they're not extreme, confusing, back-ass scary, and they're a lot less risky than fentanyl. My mind had been expanded of the possibilities of alternative treatments, and I hope one day America pulls its head out of its ass and embraces them as I did because the person you see before you is not the same person who presented for treatment. The transformation that I underwent is profound, real, and I'll be damn sure permanent. I feel the difference in my mood and I finally feel like you regular people in that for the first time in my adult life, I no longer romanticize opiates and I feel amazing without any help from an outside substance. I bop around every day like a happy idiot. I sing even though I sound like an off-key squawking bird, and I dance even though like an, I move like an ostrich on roller skates. You know that feeling when you're falling in love and you're just happy all day every day? Yeah. That's the only way I can describe how I feel after Ibogaine. I don't even get mad when people don't use their turn signals anymore. That's not true, use your fucking signals! But for real, the physical, <laughs> the physical healing that happened to my brain released me from the grips of an addiction that had chained me to my own misery for far too long. Recently, I rode back to the clinic to thank the overnight staff in person. I needed them to know how well I'm doing and how grateful I am. But as grateful as I am for them, there's only one way I can end this piece, paying tribute to the person who made it all happen. Andrea, thank you for being easy to tell the truth to for giving me seven days of your life, making every day of rehab pretty damn fun, never leaving my side, catching me from falling, and in all honesty, probably saving my life. I dedicate this to you. Christy Nail, damn second timer. Okay. I loved her, but it was diffuse and violent, like the way blood dances in water. My father's persistence on being my absolute everything left me critically unsocialized. I just didn't know how to connect with people, especially people my own age. My taste in movies and ideas were all an extension of my father, so people just didn't know me. Until I found other people who were critically unsocialized. We met in our first year of high school. I eventually left that school for, and try not to be surprised, a more liberal performing arts high school. She was amazing. She was young, but due to hardships in her home life, she was the most lived. Her mother was chronically young, though she didn't look it. She had her daughter when she was in her early teens. Her fingernails were always festering with tobacco and scratch card glue. She also lived with her cousins, who were their own chain of monsters. They would rip into her like a pack of starving dogs. She needed to be extricated from her situation. I couldn't offer her anything. My father suggested she live with us for a few months, but she always rejected that offer. She was whip smart, driven, one of those people with a full plan for their life. Plastic surgeon, that was the goal, always. She never backed down from a fight. Long talks with teachers about perceived injustices. She was fire, always hungry, always looking, always talking a mile a minute. 
I wish I could unspool my best moments with her and lay it out before you like golden thread, but there were hundreds of little moments. The long talks about grand ideas and grander plans. The hours we spent watching terrible movies together, the laughter, the fights. It was like she had this key made of bone that fit perfectly in a notch in my spine. She'd fucking hate this. Hate the way I constantly use metaphor, the flowery prose. She was pragmatic to a fault, a realist. Always had her feet so planted far in the ground, she was setting roots. She played the drums, the least metaphorical instrument. <laughs> I was always there for her until I wasn't. I'd always skirted around the edges of a genuine life-destroying depression around that age, like casually picking at the strings of a blanket until one day for no real reason at all, I just pulled the wrong thread and the whole thing unraveled. It buried me, swallowed me with teeth and tongue. I was doing anything to feel. I crawled into sex. The thing about older men is they'll say anything, do anything, call you beautiful, let you cry into them so long as you stroke their cock. They'll tell you they have a trick for loneliness or a trick of teeth and tongue and lips. Apply some young kid doesn't know any better so they try and lap off some of that youth licking out their pores. They'll give you a booster for your bar stool, put whiskey in a sippy cup, only two fingers at first, there you go, you're doing attaboy. Why not try this instead? then leave you high and dry no matter how it leaves its hooks in you. They don't just take it from you right then. They put you in a little box you're always going to carry around with you. The box you hide in that you crawl into desperately anyone tries to tell you you're worth a damn. Anytime anyone touches you. It takes the smooth curve of a hand, the warmth of a palm, and turns them into fish hooks that just dig deeper and deeper. So you start to drink because you like them and they're nice to you and you think you owe them this. They said I was beautiful, so just smile, just take it. It won't last long. It'll make them happy. You can always drink it away tomorrow. Being queer and coming of age, being another man around that time, it's a fucking speeding train. If you step on just the right time, you'll get to right where you need to go. But if you misstep by even a second, then you are consumed wholly, totally, and without protest. I can, with much practice, self-destruct perfectly. My father tried to fix me, but his own untreated mental illness set fire to mine. Only if I would worship at his altar, take his love, his fallow and malformed communion, he and only he would pull me out of the spiral. I've got this nightmare where when someone loves me, they crack open my skin like old bread and feel that same sickly love waiting on the other side. But that's all that come, will come of loving me. With him, there was always malformed causality metastasized, insecure. He would twist it like wringing the neck of a chicken and look at you, horror in his eyes, and say, look what you did. So a month passed without a word between us until one day, arbitrarily, I reached out. I asked about her living situation. She casually informed me that she was living with her new boyfriend, Mike, who was 40. Now, additionally, a former junkie, now clean, and in the gloriously healthy position of fucking a minor in an emotionally vulnerable situation. Even after all this time, I can still feel it. That anger. The utter desperate pang in my stomach that tells me I failed her. I was too involved in my own bullshit to help her avoid this. I wanted to hurt Mike. There is so much hate in me. I know anger, and I find it in the most unexpected places. Like running your hand over a shallow pond only to feel like you've weighed a powerful torrent so you can't stop. I wanted him to hurt because I hurt. It was another thing I couldn't carry. I wanted to break my fingers, shattering his jaw. I wanted to rip into his face, watch it come loose like earth and clay. I wanted to give him pain he couldn't hide from. I wanted to violate him, dig in those twisted veins and unravel them, just keep pulling. I wanted to watch sour blood pour through bone, jag at his matchstick trees, and finally blow away all that smile like a handful of cotton in the wind. He used needles, then her. I wanted to use him. Bash's skull in with a stone, and from the fractured fallow hole, all her time would slip back, blue as ocean, rich as clouds, and it would all be all right. Men are whispered to in the cradle that with an act of just violence, they can make the world right. No matter how abstract or distant the emotional topography of the situation is, no matter how scalpel-sharp time has made it, if we twist the various ligaments of the right people in the right order, then all shall be made right. Break an arm, you can see her smile again. 
unmoored tongue from bloody jaw, and she can rewind all that hurt. Break everything he has, fracturing like terracotta ruby on red spires, and not so much as a day will have passed between us. We could be who we were, and the path will be laid bare for us to walk at our leisure. That hate feels good. And that is fucking terrifying. Everyone tells me I should reach out. Use her as a footpath to start my 12 steps, moral inventory and all that. I can't do that. What honestly is the difference between me and Mike if I do that? My guilt is unbearable. It's rusted to my skin. I can feel it peel and tear as I move. The second I see her, my only goal will be to alleviate my own guilt. I still love her, and in our meeting that would be present, but it would be lost in my desire to repent, to make good, because I'm selfish. I can't keep carrying this weight, so I would give it to her. Isn't that what Mike did? First he tried heroin because he couldn't carry the weight of his own self. He threw his skull, collapsed his bones. It was just too heavy. So he stuck a needle in his veins. Then when he got clean, it was still too fucking heavy. So he decided to fuck a minor in an emotionally vulnerable position. It's the same thing. We'd both be using her. I feel like I keep failing the women in my life. My father would whisper to me that I needed to protect them. He would then in the same breath tell me sweetly, let's be monsters. So long as we can find someone to carry all of our hurt, everything will be better. It was a gradual thing, a becoming thing. It wasn't like we woke up one day and said, let's be monsters. We just needed a place to put our hate. So we carved the skin off our faces. We took our skulls, hauled them out, wove a handle out of each other's hair, and put all that hurt into each other. I still abandoned her. I did my best to try and get her out of that situation, but I wasn't stable enough for it. Every phone call was like lighting myself on fire. I started drinking desperately, heavily, trying to lessen the weight of it all. Ah, alcohol, friend, confidant, accelerant. In the end, I couldn't do it. I couldn't be there for her. I just let the connection fade and left her to whatever fate had for her. I can't reach out. I can't let her be used again. So I do this. I confess to strangers. I tell her story even though it's not mine to tell, and in the end, I still use her. I know a cure for loneliness, more a trick of teeth and tongue. I can turn those tears into beautiful fractals. Watch me slowly take your tiled bones into a spiral. It was like we were walking together on a cool night path, endless desert stretching blue as glass under a hunter's moon. We would walk slowly looking at the stars, wondering where their radiant light ended and began. Then one day without warning, the ground fell out from under my feet. I was swallowed wholly, totally, and after a while without protest. There was closure, I had blinders on, the world lost its edges. The sand gouged my eyes from my sockets, took my tongue from my mouth, reduced my bones to powder, and it felt amazing. But I clawed my way out. It was brutal and violent. I broke fingers, tore off fingernails, rendered my skin infant pink, but I made it out. I won. I could see the stars again. But there was no one beside me. Just lingering remnants of their footprints, but soon the wind would take them, and I would have no choice but to keep walking. And for the longest time, I thought that was my lot in life, to walk without purpose, destitute and rejected, until I found someone on a similar path, someone new, and our lives collided in the most fantastic of ways. Even when the nights are cloudy and that radiant light is absent, I can find it in her eyes. I can find purpose in her lips. She turned that barren desert into a radiant, lush paradise, and every flower blooms just for us. I'll take that walk now, but I'm not alone. Never alone. That is Peter Serino. All right. When people find out I work security at the world famous San Diego Zoo, they ask, what's the craziest thing you've seen? <laughs> it wasn't until my last night of employment that I was able to give them a good story. The zoo had just adopted a new deadly predator earlier that day, a lady saltwater crocodile. <laughs> she was both a male crocodile in a shared tank in a small sandy beach. My final shift, I was tasked with checking on them every hour to make sure nothing wild happened. But nature was unkind that night. <sighs> It was late June. 
My shift started at 10 p.m. Night had already strangled the sun into submission that sticky summer evening about an hour earlier. As I entered the office to gear up, there was a new face in a security uniform sitting near the chair, uh, sitting in a chair near the door. It was a pretty face that belonged to a woman named Grace. Jake, you're going to be training Grace here tonight. Show her the route and checkpoints, my, Dave, my supervisor Dave instructed. Her first night on the job and my last. I look for a fully juiced radio, the only thing that stands between a terrible situation and backup. And we also have to check the reptile tank every hour, he said. Make sure no, no, make sure no crocodile tears are shed tonight. Apparently, the female is the aggressor when these crocodiles cohabit a shared environment. And when she has a mouthful of skull-crushing teeth, it gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, happy wife, happy life. So I snagged a flashlight and figured I should check out the new girl with the new girl in training first thing. I'll take you down Monkey Trail, then we'll go up by the gorillas and over to the crocs, I said, trying to act cool with my firm grasp of the zoo grounds. She, she flashed a perfect crooked tooth grin. When we got to the crocs tank, I shined the flashlight towards a small sandy area where I know the monster reptiles like to lounge. I see one, I said. Do you see the other one anywhere? We both looked into the remote areas where I shine my light. I think I see something over there, she said. Good enough for me. We'll come back in an hour, I replied. If you can't tell, I'm pretty much checked out of this place. Over the next 60 minutes before our second check, Grace and I zipped around the zoo on our golf cart. I told her exciting stories I had heard from past security guards about slippery animal escapes in hopes to get a small scare out of her. The old night shift guard told me one of the gorillas escaped around this time of night because a contractor left a small opening in their exhibit that day, I said. No way. What happened? I guess the simian was just roaming around the zoo, aim the zoo aimlessly, probably getting into all sorts of cool shit he never knew existed. Maybe he got some ice cream and popcorn? I hope he did anyway. I mean, did they have to shoot him or anything? She asked, concerned. From what I heard, they just tranquilized him and locked him back up. Poor guy. There were a lot of tough moments that happened during my time at the zoo. Harambe, for one. One big one. One day, a couple of disheveled teenage boys noticed my security uniform, approached me, and asked if smoking was allowed at the zoo. I told them that it certainly was not. And why the fuck did you smoke Harambe? One snapped back. It was a clever joke that I couldn't help but honestly laugh at. And then I told them where the best hiding spots to smoke were. <laughs> one of the elephants even hanged itself on a fence one night, I said. The next day, they put what looked like a circus tent around the scene, and they took saws in there. You couldn't see what they were doing, but you knew what was happening. It's still eerie whenever I walk by. That's why we have to do elephant checks throughout the night. Why is I telling this new trainee all this morbid shit? Second check on the crocs. One was in the tank and one on the beach. They were behaving themselves and keeping their distance from one, from one another so far. But not Grace and me. I was showing her all around the shops and food stands, telling her what you could get, what you could get away with because that's what a good trainer does. The night was heating up. I took her to Sabretooth Grill and poured us a couple of lemonades on the house, of course. So why do you want to work security at the zoo, I asked, taking large swigs from my cup. I just wanted to work here doing anything, she said. Seems like such a fun place to work. That's pretty much how I felt, too. I came here one day with some family and saw a security guard driving around, and I thought, I could do that gig. I applied a few days later, and boom, here I am. Oh, my. So is it awesome working here, or what? I smiled and thought about it for a moment. It was a cool and fun job on the surface, but the mystique quickly fizzles as the zoo shrinks into what feels like a little town of animal prison and sadness. I don't want to tell Grace this, as she seems so excited by the thought of working in such an exotic setting. Come on, I want to meet a friend of mine, I said. He lives over in the children's zoo. The keys on my duty belt jingled, and the sounds of a parrot squawking became intensely audible as we walked down a back path in the children's zoo. Since Grace would be taking my spot on the security roster, it was imperative that, imperative that she have a proper introduction to one of my good avian pals, who I'd be leaving behind. Rio was a yellow-headed Amazon parrot. He wasn't from Brazil, Mexico rather, but he acted like every night was carnival, dancing and flapping those yellow wings of his. I spent a lot of time with Rio during night shifts, and on most days when I would work, he'd be the first animal I would visit. 
We enjoyed deep conversations that went like this. Hi, Rio. Hi, he would reply. Hi, I say again. Hi. 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 <laughs> this would go on for about five to 10 minutes until I resumed my duties. And it would happen a few more times on any given shift. This is Rio, I said to Grace. Hi, Rio, she said. Hi, Rio responded. Be good to Rio when, I, when I'm gone, I said. He has family trauma. Really? No. But maybe. <laughs> Time to check the Crocs again. It was 3 a.m., the witching hour. When I shined my light on, in the tank and I saw the mail in the water, there's one, I said. I shined the light on the beach, but nothing was there. Where the hell is it? I panned the stream of light on a concrete slab and noticed a dark, oily substance all over the ground. What the hell? I studied and studied the substance with squinted eyes until I saw that the substance was red. Oh, that's fucking blood. I looked around frantically and saw more blood, and more blood, and more blood. Blood was fucking everywhere. What's going on? Where's the other crocodile? Is it the one I saw in the tank dead? Is it that one's blood? Whose blood did this belong to? My eyes widened as I desperately tried to remain calm and collected. It wasn't supposed to be like this. My final night on the job, having to train a new guard, domestic crocod crocodile violence to the highest degree. Murder. Grace, do you see the other croc anywhere? We need to find it. There was movement further down on the concrete slab. When I found it with my flashlight, there stood the other crocodile in her natural push-up position, like a crossfitter from hell. <laughs> With her tongue dangling from a jawless head in a pool of her own blood, a natural sinister smile from the beast's face gazed in our direction. I noticed a small piece of white meat on the ground a couple feet from her and realized it was her detached jaw. Holy shit, I said, consumed by disbelief. Grace was gobsmacked. What do we do, she cried. You have to go in there and grab the jaw, like a rite of passage thing. <laughs> I joked, trying to ease the air. She looked at me unamused. I was told the male croc was the one we needed to be looking out for, but it was his actions that led to such a gory crime scene. Fumbling for the correct button, I called my supervisor over the radio and sternly told him he needed to, get, needed to get down there as soon as he could. When he saw the horror, he quickly urged us to go back to the office and call the reptile keepers. Wake their asses out of bed if you have to, he ordered. The reptile keepers came in and pushed us out of the way. Grace and I watched from behind the glass as they harnessed the female from the enclosure. What do you think they're going to do with her, she asked me. Euthanasia, maybe? How's she supposed to be without a jaw? We looked on as the sun began its morning stretch. The birds began to sing and play, and the animals started waking up, not knowing what happened in their little zoo town just hours prior. We stood there in silence, blank-faced, traumatized, unable not to think about what we had just witnessed. I turned to Grace and asked, So, you still want to work here? Damn first timer, Jake Peterson. So without further ado, your three storytellers that you've been waiting on. Up next is Adam Greenfield. When I was 15 years old, I was looking for any way to give the world the middle finger. One of those ways was with some of my friends, one of those friends in particular was Rico Jones. Rico was tall and lean and had jet black hair, and his wide smile often stood in contrast to his darker skin tone. And while our separate home lives were both full of the same kind of turmoil, it was what was inside Rico that drew me to him. Rico had a dark edge that he never hid from anyone. His behavior was brash and dangerous, yet his loyalty to his friends was steadfast. During the time Rico and I were friends, my life felt upside down. I grew up watching my father physically and mentally abuse my brother and mother, and even felt the brunt of that abuse many times myself, all before I was 10 years old. It splintered the small family to the point that I was no longer speaking with my brother, now off at college at this point, and my mother and I argued daily. So my friends quickly became my family and welcomed me with open arms, yet also with handfuls of bad ideas. The summer of 1990, the same summer I turned 15, 
Rico and myself and James, another friend who lived a few doors down from Rico, were hanging out regularly. The planned community slash town we lived in, Columbia, Maryland, was barely 20 years old at the time, so houses and new neighborhoods were springing up regularly. We would break into abandoned or almost built homes, punch out windows or kick holes in walls, and try to break off and steal the fanciest hood ornaments from cars. In case you're wondering, some of those fuckers are hard to get off, <laughs> especially Jaguars. Pro tip, bring wire cutters. Look, I am far from proud of this behavior now, but at the time, I glommed onto this rebellious idiocy because, well, the world owed it to me. I didn't ask for a shitty, abusive father, right? I was angry, hurt, and it was my turn to punch back. Soon enough, I was wearing all black, combat boots, and putting my hair up like Robert Smith from The Cure. I even wore a trench coat for a month or two, which I eventually decided just looked silly on short people, so I stopped wearing it. <laughs> One summer afternoon, James and I heard the unmistakable sound of someone cutting wood near the back of Rico's house. We walked over and noticed it was Rico making all the noise with the saw and sheets of plywood. Rico stopped sawing, slid the goggles up and rested them on his greasy black hair, now flecked with wood dust, and smiled when we asked what he was doing. You'll see. He slid his goggles back down and resumed cutting. I didn't know where Rico got the wood or the tools. Still don't. But I didn't care. And still don't. At the time, I was just fascinated watching Rico sawing wood. I had no clue he had any skills like this. I didn't know him long by this point, maybe a year or so, but his resourcefulness quickly became another thing I admired about him. Soon enough, it became clear what he was building, a coffin. You know, he said with a giant smile when he was done, to sleep in. <laughs> now, while this may seem like odd behavior to many, to me, it wasn't. Sure, why would anyone want to sleep in a coffin, let alone build their own? But this was Rico and that dark edge I was drawn to. I would say Rico was thinking outside of the box, but obviously that would be factually incorrect in this situation. <laughs> this same summer, the three of us had girlfriends who were also all friends. I was dating Mary. Mary had fiery red hair and was slightly taller than me, and her voice had a slight rasp to it, as if she'd been smoking cigarettes for 50 years already. <laughs> Rico and James were sexually active with their girlfriends, which was something Mary and I talked about a lot as we were both virgins. Fooled around heavily, became masters in groping and dry humping. But it never progressed further. Neither of us wanted to be virgins, but we just couldn't find the right place and time to have sex, at least enough to feel comfortable with it. On a late summer day, we all made plans to meet up at Rico's dad's house to hang out later that night. His dad wasn't gonna be home, and his younger twin brothers would be with other family members, so the six of us could have the house to ourselves. Mary and I knew we were going to be hanging out in a private place, so we thought, maybe this is our night. All day I was glowing. I might have been sweating. I was 15 after all. But whatever it was, I was happy. And even felt, dare I say, cool. First things first, though, condoms. Now, for those of you that have been a teenage boy trying to buy condoms, you'll understand the mixture of feelings and confusion I experienced when doing so. The brightly lit aisles in the grocery store in our neighborhood made me feel like I was under such a strong microscope that my dead Jewish grandmother could see what her good Jewish grandson was doing. <laughs> but all she would really see is me stone-footed in front of colorful boxes of condoms with words I didn't really understand, at least in the context of condoms. Ribbed, lubricated, different sizes. How do I know what rib does? Condoms have ribs? And lubrication, for what? And how the hell am I supposed to know what size will fit? Is there a dressing room I can try it on somewhere first? <laughs> but I didn't have time for these questions now. Tonight was the night. Standing in front of the variety of condoms to choose from, I quickly grabbed a box of Trojans, I'd at least heard of those, and hustled to the counter, eyes on my feet the entire time. I gave the woman behind the counter the money, eyes still on my feet, then walked out without even getting change. So much for feeling cool. As the night progressed, Mary and I realized we didn't have much time, maybe an hour or so before her ride came to take her home. We made our move, snuck out of the dark living room, and headed up the stairs hand in hand. When we reached the top, we had three bedroom options, Rico's dad's room, his twin brother's room, or his room. Definitely not his dad's room, Mary said. How old are his brothers? Seven, I replied. Ew, she rightly said. Rico's room it is. And that's when I remembered Rico slept in a coffin. <laughs> P 
panic set in. I had no clue how Mary was going to react. Was I about to lose my chance at having sex for the first time because of Rico's gothic side? But before I could say anything, Mary started walking towards his room. When she got to the doorway, she discovered what I had just remembered about Rico's sleep environment. What the fuck, she said. <laughs> yeah, he sleeps in there. Mary sighed, shoulders slumping them some, then said, whatever, and walked in the room. <laughs> yep, I was about to lose my virginity in a coffin, and I was totally there for it. I smiled wide. We began lighting... <laughs> We began lighting the red candles Rico had scattered around his room. When we felt we had enough light to see, we climbed into the coffin but left the lid up. <laughs> Rico's coffin was very rudimentary, just made of plywood with no finish on it. For cushioning, he had glued thick pads of foam to the bottom of the coffin and on the underside of the lid, something I would soon be grateful for. Now, typical coffins aren't meant for two people, alive or dead, and Rico's was no different. Still, we were determined to make this work, so we began fooling around to get in the mood. Because of Mary's height, it took a moment for her to find a good position, but once she did, we found our groove. Eventually, the moment arrived. You still want to do this? I asked. I do, she replied. And her reply had a slight echo to it, you know, because we were in a box shaped like a coffin. <laughs> I got up on my knees and began unbuttoning my pants while Mary started hitching up her skirt. But Rico was a skinny guy, so he didn't make the coffin very wide. I had to stand up to pull my pants down past my thighs and all the way down to my ankles. I did so, got back on my knees, one of Mary's legs hanging out over the side of the coffin, <laughs> and began putting the condom on. Seeing as it was my first time, it took a minute, but I eventually got it on. The lubrication didn't help the trembling 15-year-old hands. I wiggled my way into position and began to lower myself towards Mary when the lid came crashing down on my back. I fell on top of Mary, who let out a little gust of air. Shit, I said, and pushed the lid back up. You okay? Mary let out a little laugh. Yeah, I'm fine. And with that, we began. I could tell Mary was slightly uncomfortable with her leg over the side of the coffin, but at the same time, she was really into making this happen. We talked about it and fooled around long enough. Fortunately for the blood circulation in Mary's leg, it was over quickly. We were both breathing heavy by the time we were done, but I'm not sure if that's because of the act itself or if it was because of the circus moves of trying to have sex in a coffin. Still, we were both smiling, happy for what just happened. That was interrupted by James's girlfriend downstairs. Mary, she called up the stairs, gotta go, our ride's here. Well, that was a quick hour scrambled out of the coffin, and quickly began redressing. We still had most of our clothes on, so it didn't take long, but we were kind of giddy and smiling. We kissed a few times and laughed a little bit. Let's go, James' girlfriend called up. All right, Mary screamed back. As we made our way down the stairs, the reality that I just had sex in a coffin set in. But I wasn't creeped out by it, and I didn't really think it was all that weird. Might have been the adrenaline still pumping, or just the blood still distracted in other places and not made it all the way to my brain yet, but all I could do was smile because of the realization that I just had sex, which was quickly followed by the realization that I still had a used condom on. <laughs> the events of that night have always been something I've both cherished and winced about. Could we have waited until a better location presented itself? Probably. But hormones are a hell of a thing for teenagers. They make you do things you'd never think you'd do. Mary and I, now feeling no fear, continued to have sex wherever we could after that night. In the woods near our houses, in a car, whenever parents weren't around. Never again, though, at Rico's. And even though I never want to have sex in a coffin again, I'll always be chasing that dragon. Adam Greenfield! could have been a detective. Not that I'm hyper observant or a good judge of character, nor do I want to trick innocent people into confessing to unsolved crimes, but I am persistent. One might say obsessive. My first case started with a letter in the mail about a credit card I did not apply for. 
back when identity theft was a new crime. I launched into action like a dime novel detective on steroids because I had the latest invention that let you investigate leads from wherever you had a landline and a wire from your desktop to your phone jack. The internet. Juno turned every American into an instant genealogist, detective, and or stalker. Because the scammer got some of my info wrong, the bank rejected it and said, I had nothing to worry about. It was not in my personality not to worry when someone tells me not to worry. Banks didn't know how to deal with this crime back then, so they just put me on hold and then assured me if there had been fraudulent charges, all I'd have to do was prove it. Because of course, the victim should have to prove their innocence. When I asked for an investigation into who applied for the card, I was told banks only probe fraud on current accounts. Well, they didn't succeed this time, but what about next? They didn't care. Soon, I got a letter about my Wells Fargo application, and then one from B of A. Oh, hell no, this fraudster was destroying my peace and my privacy, two things that I am fiercely protective of. I use a junk mail address and a phone number that's fake for everything. You know that saying, like, I wrote the book on privacy. Well, I actually did. Someone using my name, my birth date, my social security number made me livid. Was it a shady ex? And I had some. A shady ex coworker? Also had some. Or just a loser I never met. The worst part was I had no control over it. I've always had a little trouble letting go. Kids who grow up in households with addiction, dysfunction, or chaos often don't get their needs met. They tend to become controlling or compulsive as adults. In my upbringing, I was surrounded with that, and as an adult, I had to be the one in charge, and I love math, which is perfect if you're obsessive. Like on road trips, it's fun to calculate in my head how long it'll take to arrive and how much faster if I increase speed by a couple miles per hour, and then I recalculate every 10 miles, and it's more fun than I spy with my little eye, and maybe this is why I'm a loner. I was going to solve this, and the perp would be punished. Six banks had sent letters. I was still told to do nothing. I knew from researching my book, this could be devastating. People were jailed for crimes committed by their identity thief, and there were no protections like credit freezes. My impatience took hold. I needed to feel I was doing something to protect myself. I methodically worked through my list of banks, asking what details were on my application. They said that's confidential. Oh, I'm sorry, are you protecting the privacy of the person who's using my identity? And the answer was yes, they were. So I changed tactics with the next rep. I applied for a credit card but didn't get it. Where'd you send it? And he read me an address in fabulous Buckeye, Arizona a town then known for having lots of tweakers and not much else. But hey, it is a dare community. <laughs> I'd have to call the Buckeye police, and I had not had good experiences with cops as a kid or as an adult. They had no fraud division. Finally, I reached Detective Bill, who may in fact have been the town's only detective. I told him I'd bagged a suspect, practically. In a low drawl, he said an address wasn't enough to go on. So what would he need? He researched it and said he'd need the IP address used to submit the card applications and a copy of each application. And then he warned me this case wasn't his priority. Thanks, Detective Bill. So obviously it was time to quit because I'm not a hacker. I barely knew what an IP address was, and the person whose job it is had no interest. Also, I had a full-time job, and my work was suffering. For weeks, I researched all night, and then called banks and police while at work, all in pursuit of a nameless, faceless entity that could be anywhere in the world. What kind of a nut job would engage in this fruitless endeavor? 
well, I was one who, as a 14-year-old, recorded every calorie I ate every day for a year, and then I'd add the calories to a chart that I then memorized, and then I counted how many laps I swam and how many calories that burned, and with all those calculations, I could avoid processing other parts of my life, like that I lived with constant emotional abuse, that I became depressed at age 12 and sought revenge, cold, underhanded revenge on those who'd hurt me. Being obsessive served in this escape then and now, and it was distraction from my unresolved trauma. So I went through my list of banks once again, requesting the applications, which they refused. But someone mentioned a second card holder. Oh, maybe it's my family, I lied. Who is it? It was Joanne Holmes. Later, I got the employer she listed, three phone numbers, and an email, Chingy's girl at Yahoo. You know, like the rapper? Now I had nailed the perp, practically. But she got smarter, like some sort of evil mastermind who loves rap. <laughs> because Miss Holmes now spelled my name correctly and used an address where I had lived, I was now the not-so-proud owner of a Walmart card, which she tried to use on Black Friday. In Buckeye, she was there. Walmart, again, didn't investigate, so I called the store manager and asked her to review the store video from that day. She said the police had to request it. Time for me to brief Detective Bill, who was so old-fashioned he preferred fax over email. So I faxed a stack of leads from my office while I was working. He thanked me, joking that I was doing his job. I thanked the internet and the fact that no one at home had picked up the phone while I was using dial-up. But the detective hadn't gotten subpoenas for the IP address yet because, get this, he was waiting on books from the library about how to investigate identity fraud. He'd never had a fraud case. So I explained to him how I tracked everything down which was kind of appropriate because a few years before that, I had figured out how to buy black market drugs using a credit card on the internet because I was a genius and also a moron. Don't tell Detective Bill because Buckeye does dare. With no faith in the police, it was up to me. I recalled every time I tried to stand up for myself, only to be punished for it. There was no one to save me, like always. So off I went to call the credit bureaus, which listed nine addresses where I'd never lived. Four were the bureau's mistake, two were dead ends, and the other three were in, you guessed it, Buckeye. Using real estate records, which were photos, nothing searchable, I finally found the owner of one of those Buckeye addresses. Through marriage records, I ID'd his wife. According to the interwebs, the couple was in their 60s and did not have criminal records. So I made up a theory. They were renting their house out. Using a new service called reverse address search, I got a phone number and I called. When the husband answered, I introduced myself as a journalist, which I practically am. I asked if he was renting a house to one Joanne Holmes. I brought him up to speed and gave him my police case number. He was upset and said that might be their renter's roommate. He said he'd give the info to Detective Bill, who I hoped would act on it. Then it happened. I got approved for credit cards with Chase and Dell so she could buy a computer. I had an e-machine, which was ancient even then, and this chick was stealing new desktops in my name. That's when I got personal. If she was employed, I'd make sure she wasn't. I called her workplace, told them what Joanne Holmes was up to, and invited them to call my partner, Detective Bill. Pumped with adrenaline, I then made a rash decision. 
being a victim inflamed me and I would never be taken advantage of again. Spoiler alert, I would. I hit star six, seven and called her. When her answering machine picked up, I said, hi, Joanne Holmes, AKA Chingy's girl. This is Jay Carroll. You've been using my social security number. Please stop. <laughs> I know who you are, and I know everything. I'll tell you how to hang up the phone back then. <laughs> the next day, Detective Bill called. He asked, have you uh, ever bought anything from <clears throat> Victoria's Secret? I got embarrassed only because he was. Yeah, the suspect worked there. And to my shock, the detective had subpoenaed Walmart and gotten her on video. That morning, he'd raided her house, which was stuffed with packages addressed to different names. There was even my credit report with full account numbers sent to her since goddamn TransUnion didn't remove her address from my records. From the volume of mail, she was running a large identity theft ring, he said, and he'd now contact the other victims. He congratulated me for breaking it up and thanked me for letting him be my partner. Be my partner. Yeah, Detective Bill was a good guy. But there was bad news. He had cased Miss Holmes's house the day before, but for some reason she had fled in the night. Something had tipped her off. It's unlikely he'd ever find her without knowing her name or anything about her. I'm sure she wasn't a tweaker though because Buckeye does dare. <laughs> While I was playing detective, I forgot Joanne Holmes could be a stolen identity just like mine. I had cyber stalked people and possibly gotten an innocent person fired. After working 60 hours night and day on the case, I learned a good detective knows when to bust them and when to do nothing, which I'd been incapable of when I was being so reactive. With that one call, I blew it all, and that was my rookie mistake. Thank you. Jay Carroll, everybody, she's Woo! on the case. Since I was 14 years old, I've been in bands. Not like school bands, but regular people bands. Bands for people who don't like giant hats. And since I was, have no discernible musical talent, I've been in punk bands. To be clear, I was the singer in punk bands. Not, punk, pu not pop punk or proto punk, but punk bands. Which means instead of singing, I yelled into a microphone about my parents and shit. The Mutant Turtles, Produce, The Stomach Monkeys, Downtrodden, Animal Farm, American Market, The Game Overs, The Kankles are just a few of the bands I was in that didn't break up after the third practice. I was a scenester in high school, and I spent my weekends at all the venues one my age could get into in San Diego. I went to Soma, the old Soma, not that one, the other one. Iguanas in TJ, Soul Kitchen, and dozens of random houses and halls. I almost exclusively listened to punk and punk rock, but right around the time I turned 21, a new musical genre swept the nation. It was called emo, and it fucking sucked. <laughs> it was all bands who looked exactly the same, singing grade school lyrics about how sad they were that they scraped their knees rollerblading or some dumb bullshit. They would mope around the stage, and I can only imagine spent their free time ironically getting black flag tattoos. Every song by every emo band, or even worse, screamo band, should have just been titled Boo Hoo. They all sounded the same, and they were very popular, and it infuriated me. So in response to this wave of musical mutilation, my friend Matt and I started a new punk band called Bad Credit. We had three goals. Let's do everything we can to make fun of emo bands and their fans. Let's only have fun and never worry about being liked or popular. In fact, let's not be liked at all. And three, let's be punk as fuck. 
Calling ourselves a punk band confused most people because technically we played music akin to Run DMC and early Beastie Boys. And Matt and I both rapped slash screamed in the band. How can you be a punk band if you're rapping, is a question someone who listened to Dashboard Confessionals might ask. <laughs> you see the greatest misconception about punk music, and strap in, kids, because old man punk is talking, <laughs> is that punk is centered around music. Punk is an attitude and a style. It's about bucking the system and not showering. It's about doing the opposite of what you're told and being an asshole. It's like being a vegan. <laughs> <laughs> Talking heads were punk. Public enemy is punk. The offspring, never punk. They sounded punk, but weren't. Here's a perfect example. One time I was backstage at a Bad Religion show. Greg Graffin, the singer of Bad Religion, was in an elevator waiting for the doors to close. I was running to the elevator and asked him to hold the doors, and he said, no. And he pushed the button to shut the doors before I could get there. That's punk. <laughs> Punk music is a chaotic experience that as soon as it's classified, immediately becomes not punk. This is where Bad Credit lived, a chaotic experience that we forced upon a crowd. We decided we'd be a gimmick. We'd only write songs about financial issues and sometimes dress as bankers. <laughs> we wrote our first song as a joke. It was called Bill Gates Owes Me Five Bucks. <laughs> and it was the dumbest song ever written. Oh, it's playing through the computer. That's okay. It's too late now. This is such a good metaphor for my story. All right. <laughs> the bridge to Bill Gates was just us rapping the alphabet. It was dumb. <laughs> But it was a blast, and what's better is that people were so caught off guard, the only thing they could do was sing along. We performed it for the first time at an open mic at a bar called the Blarney Stone Pub. It was a tiny Irish pub in San Diego that was at the end of a strip mall. We had gone in the bar a few times already, but our friend and future guitar player dared us to go up and rap Bill Gates' a cappella. And the eight drunks that were still there at midnight absolutely went apeshit. They loved us. We came back the next week, and then the next week, and after about two months, we had written five songs. Party anthems about financial advice. We wrote simple call and response choruses centered around capitalism and how much we hated Ben Affleck. <laughs> Although, Affleck was bombing chasing Amy. After a few open mics in a row, where we had pretty much filled the place, the bar gave us our own night. We had five songs and somehow played for two hours. <laughs> We had put together one of the best backing bands in the history of San Diego music. That's not a joke. We wanted the absolute stupidity of it all to also be legitimate. So you couldn't just say we sucked, because we didn't. But you could say we were dumb. We gave ourselves stupid MC names. Matt was known as Optimus Rhyme. Everybody get it? All right, great. <laughs> I was Dr. Cliff Mixtable. <laughs> based on Bill Cosby's character from The Cosby Show. This was before he was added as a shitbag. He was still America's dad, and I was America's greatest financial MC. We also had a friend who called himself Mitch. He would just stand on stage and do absolutely nothing. The next time we played, there was a line all the way around Vaughn's just to get in. We had created something completely idiotic, and somehow people loved it. After a few months, we had been interviewed in every local publication in which we lied about everything, and still do. We've never given a real answer to any question and still haven't, because who cares? The whole point was nothing we did mattered, and emo sucks. People should focus on that instead of how we all met. We started playing other bars around town, putting on drunken marathons that sometimes would last till one in the morning. It was like the shittiest version of a Bruce Springsteen concert. We got a manager when we met San Diego music legend O. He loved our attitudes and loved booking us on shows where he knew the audience would hate us and then he would watch us turn them. <laughs> no venue had a financial hip hop punk night, so we just latched on to wherever we could. At the Blarney Stone, we'd climb tables, the bar, slowly move our instruments to the other sides of the room so we were surrounding the crowd. We wanted the experience of a bad credit show to be one you wouldn't forget. We wanted to break all the rules, but in such a fun way you had no choice but to smile while we kicked over your drinks, stole your hats, and left with your girlfriends and sometimes boyfriends. 
We wanted every place we played to be a larger version of the Blarney Stone and possibly never invite us back. If a venue told us not to leave the stage, it's the first thing we did. If they told us not to bring drinks on stage, we brought out every drink we could hold. If they said don't climb the equipment or make fun of the other bands or whatever, we did the opposite. We just couldn't handle anyone taking what we were doing seriously. We were punishing you for believing in us. <laughs> One time we were asked to play a huge New Year's Eve show with thousands of people in the crowd. Some bands would consider this a huge opportunity, but we drank beer. We were slated to play 30 minutes. When the sound guy realized we'd be starting our last song with only one minute left in our set, he told us over the monitors we had to end the set immediately. That guy was not punk. We started our last song anyway and just happened to build in a five minute long jam session. At minute three of said session, the sound guy turned everything off. We finished the song anyway. And at the end, Matt and I disconnected our mics from their wires and threw them into the audience. Of course, now I feel bad about some of the things we did, but not all of them, and not that. Sound guys are fucking narcs. <laughs> about a year in, we put out an EP. It was immediately nominated for a San Diego Music Award for Best Hip Hop Album. <laughs> There's no hyperbole in this sentence. I peed my pants laughing when I heard about that. <laughs> of course we lost, and of course we should have lost. We got reamed in the reader in Slam Magazine by actual hip-hop artists, which made everything that much more hilarious to us. One punk zine described us as the band you have to go see and be amazed you didn't throw something at. We started to make actual money and lots of people were coming out to see us play. None of this made any sense to us. Like an absurd joke that became real. Like if you jokingly told a child a fart would make them die and then they died. That also sounds like the subject of some dumb emo song about how as a kid, a singer's parents lied to him about his farts and now he can't hold a relationship or some shit. <laughs> we wrote a few more songs and then in late 2003, we opened for a band we had always loved called the Aquabats. If there might be one other band that we would get what we were doing, it would be the Aquabats. And they did. We opened, them, we opened for them at Soma. Not that one, the other one. And we hit it off right away. They invited us to open for them the next night, and then a few months later, we were on a nationwide tour with the Aquabats. We played all over the country. We sold merch. We had a tour van, had groupies. All the things we'd always wanted for years were finally happening. Labels were setting up meetings. Clothing companies were just giving us free clothes. I mean, what the hell was going on? It was all so perfect that it almost seemed inevitable we would fuck it all up. And we did. It was one of those snowball effects where one thing in the formula changed and the experiment was completely ruined. Our bass player, who went by foot, <laughs> he quit and he moved to Brazil. Why? He liked Portuguese, and I wish I was making that up. We hired a new play we, sorry, we hired a new bass player who went by Dalla Bill, and he was unbelievably talented. However, he had kids. This meant he needed to provide for his family, and we absolutely hated that idea. But he rightfully started to push for more money, more practice, more tour touring and merch, marketing, etc. This made us work harder, and holy shit was at the opposite of what we wanted to do. Then our guitar player, Methodist Man, <laughs> he got married. Ugh. He still wanted to play, but it became more and more clear his priorities were elsewhere. After a couple of years playing Sam and Diane with our musical career, we came to an impasse. Matt, my Bad Credit co-founder and best friend, started to write real songs and take on side projects, which made him no longer look at Bad Credit like a joke he was in on, but a joke he couldn't escape. Seeing all this happen, I decided to make one fatal mistake. I started to care. I broke every rule we laid out in the beginning, because caring is emo and sometimes screamo. <laughs> I looked at it like this. We'd individually spent at least a decade or more toiling in dumb band after dumb band, trying to make a dent in the world of music, trying to write meaningful songs that might one day matter to someone. But all those years and all that effort never panned out. And now here we were writing songs called Dookie Rope and We're Better Than Your Boyfriend's Band. And hundreds, sometimes thousands of people were dancing, smiling, and enjoying what we were doing. We got here by not caring one bit. In fact, we made it a point to only care about not caring. To go so far the other way, we've been banned from a handful of venues for being disrespectful. 
But now headlining offers kept rolling in. Shows were selling out. The band wanted more. But none of us knew how to say it. The truth was, after almost five years of being idiots, we wanted to be taken seriously. And we didn't know how to do that. I mean, we had a manager, but he quit the second day on our first tour when we played in Vegas and our hotel room smelled so bad he just went home. <laughs> After that, we just never cared about getting a manager again, so I kind of took over the job. Someone had to make calls and get paid, but I wasn't good at it. I was always amazed anyone was going to pay us anything at all. I just always said yes to whatever the offer was. It was all fun and games, but we needed someone who knew what they were doing, and we had gained a reputation that didn't lend itself to the creme de la creme of guidance. I pretty much begged our old manager to come back and help us out. He booked us on a string of shows and put us back in the studio to get us refocused. And all it did was make us unravel. The push to write music that was great music rather than party anthems opened a fault line between Matt and I. After we recorded an album, we went back on the road for a West Coast Christmas tour. We always came together on stage. No matter what the problem or the argument or whatever might be bothering us, we got it all out on stage, which would sometimes result in us physically hurting each other on stage and breaking each other's equipment. It was all forgiven once the crowd cheered. After a few rough months of recording, we hoped this Christmas tour would fix the rift. Methodist man finally left the band to start a family, and our original guitar player, Easy Illiterate, came back to play the tour. Our drummer could only make half the show, so Mitch, the guy who normally just stood there on his phone and did nothing, played drums. Matt and I drank harder and harder. The writing was on the wall. This isn't to say we didn't have fun on tour. Tour is always fun. It's the most fun. You have no responsibility other than to get to the venue and play, and we could always do that, and we had the most fun doing that. The second to last show on the tour was in LA, and Bob Two from Devo came backstage after. He was carrying a bottle of whiskey and told us we were the best band he'd seen in a long time. We then drank the rest of that bottle and walked down the street to watch Fishbone play at midnight in some dingy shithole bar. And I'll be honest, that particular story has nothing to do with anything other than I like to say it out loud because it makes me feel good. <laughs> The last show on the tour was back at home in San Diego playing a New Year's Eve show at the Blarney Stone Pub. You see, no matter how big we got or how many larger venues we played, we always came back to the Blarney Stone a couple of times a year. This was always a problem within the band. Half the band absolutely hated playing there and never wanted to go back. And the other half was me. There was no real stage, the bar was half the size of the room, so everything sounded bad, and we always drank way too much, either resulting in the most fun you'll ever have at a show or the worst show you've ever seen in your life. This was a particularly raucous show, with chairs and tables being demolished, fights breaking out in the crowd, and fights breaking out between the band and the crowd. It ended with me cutting my hand open on a broken pint glass and our drummer throwing his bass drum at a drunk guy. Happy New Year! <laughs> The show was over and we all just kind of left. Matt and I went and got a burrito but didn't talk about the show or band at all. He went home and I went back to the bar. We didn't talk to each other for two weeks, not a text or call, nothing. We played one more show a month later at the Casbah. We headlined some weird night for a new genre that we might have helped create called Nerdcore. We didn't practice before the show. We barely talked before we played. After the show, our bass player told us he had to quit. Our drummer was going on tour with Macy Gray for a few months, and the guitar player who was filling in for us had just signed to Capitol Records. We never officially broke up. There was never a moment where we blew up at each other and ended it. We just stopped. We had shows booked for the next six months that I just canceled without asking anyone, and no one ever asked me about them. It just got too exhausting being exhausting, and it was too late to take anything seriously. Matt and I didn't talk for months. When we finally reconnected, we had lunch. He told me he quit drinking and was going back to church. Not punk. <laughs> but emo. <laughs> we would randomly get offered a show here or there, and I'd ask for some insane amount of money, knowing they'd never agree. Matt and I kept working together, writing and making music for shows like Yo Gabba Gabba and the Aquabat Super Show, but we never started another band together. I would randomly see the other band members at a wedding or funeral or a show. We'd text every now and then just to check in. Then in 2018, about 10 years after we stopped playing, we were all randomly at the same show at the same time and joked about doing a reunion right then. We laughed hysterically at this idea, and then we did it. We played one song, 
Bill Gates owes me five bucks. And to our surprise, a lot of people in the crowd still knew it. Then we thought, let's make it official. Let's play a real reunion show. We met up in Matt's garage and kicked back a few C minuses. We talked about what our lives were now, our families, and that kind of bullshit. Then our guitar player finally asked, why did we stop? It was a bold question from one of the two guys who actually ever quit the band, but it was a fair one. We all gave our reasons. None of them made sense in retrospect, but in all honesty, it kind of helped us heal. Boo-hoo. We decided to practice a couple times and see what happened. It felt good. We sounded good. We were back to having fun. We booked a couple of shows a few months down the road, and everything was set in motion. Then COVID. All our shows were canceled, and the text group we'd all been chatting in slowly started to dry up. When venues opened back up, and we started talking about the reunion once again, but the fire we lit under ourselves had dimmed a bit, and that's where we left it, kind of like the last time we left it. We aren't mad. We aren't sad. We just aren't. If we do ever play a show together again, I imagine it'll be a celebration of everything we did as idiots in our 20s. A reminder for our kids that at one time we were cool. We were punk. We actually accomplished what we set out to do. And one time, Bob Two from Devo got drunk with us and told us we were the best band he'd seen in a long time. And that was Dallas McLaughlin. Thank you all. Wasn't that an amazing show? Didn't you enjoy yourself? Doesn't it feel good to be able to be back out with your vaccinated asses with other people? Holy shit. Yeah, getting a, getting a charge here. So I have two really important things, if you can please keep paying attention to the ivermectin. So this happens every month. And now it's your turn. The way this works is that we have a blind submission process every month. The next deadline is November 1st for the show, I think, on the 23rd. Um, usually this show's the last Thursday of the month. What's that? Usually this show's the last Thursday of the month. We mess around with it because of the holidays, of course. Um, but the, usually the first Sunday is the deadline. So you write something, you submit it. It's blind submission. The people who read it at So Say We All don't know who wrote it. And the stories are selected, seven or eight stories for the show. Then you workshop it. You meet all the other people, all these gorgeous, amazing, genius, fun people that were in the show tonight all got to meet each other. And, and workshop their stories together, make them better. They get mentors and coaches, who I will mention by name, because they're important volunteers. So you develop your story through the month. You get to meet all these amazing other creative people, writing people, theater people, people who help you with your story. And then you do the show. So I want you all to consider it. I want you all to submit. Submit early, submit often, um, and, and get up here. It's, 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 a really, it's a really fun way to connect and be part of the scene here in town. I am going to thank our volunteers. So volunteers for the show tonight, for the event, for the merch table, for the video, for everything, include Jen Coburn, Lauren Fish, Brent Hanafy, Hallie Schilling, Killian Whitlock, and Eileen Zimmerman. Thank you. And then, and then the amazing, the amazing writing, writing and performance coaches who, again, helped every single person evolve their story from what it was like when they submitted it to what you saw tonight, what you saw and heard tonight. Also, Jen Coburn, Jordan Coburn, Sherry Ingle, Heidi Handelsman, Louise, Louise Julig, Ibra Lambert, Dustin Markell, and Eileen Zimmerman. And then once again, so you, once again, so you know their names... Our performers tonight were Yvette Valadez, Christy Nail, Peter Serino, Jake Peterson, Adam Greenfield, Jay Carroll, and Dallas McLaughlin. Thank you. Good night. Hang out. Support your Whistle Stop. We love Whistle Stop. Whistle Stop loves you. Have a good night. Bill Gates. What? He owes me five bucks. Bill Gates. What? He owes me five bucks. Bill Gates. What? He owes me five bucks, Bill Gates. What? I can't fill my wallet if I got the dough. And I'm spinning on a whim, cause I got more cash than an ATM. Don't give me no check, all COD. I want the cold hard cash. Show me the money. You're out the door, cause I'm getting a page. Put a hundred in my wallet, just a spare change. Driving fast cars, and I'm wearing a tux. I'm calling up Bill Gates, cause he owes me five bucks, Bill Gates. 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 He owes me five bucks, Bill Gates.
five bucks, Bill Gates. Uh, I can't put my wallet up, Gates. Uh, we owe five bucks, Bill Gates. Uh, we owe five bucks, Bill Gates. Uh, we owe five bucks, Bill Gates. Uh, I can't put my wallet up.